This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ramika Vincent Leary and welcome to this edition of In Studio. Since 1970, it's been recognized in the U.S. and globally. It also occurs April 22nd of every year. I'm talking about Earth Day. The brainchild behind a national day to focus on the environment was Gaylord Nelson. He was a senator from Wisconsin who had witnessed the devastation of the 1969 massive oil spill in Santa Barbara, California. Now, as 1970 came to a close, the first Earth Day led to the creation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the passage of the Clean Air, Clean Water, and Endangered Species Acts. During this broadcast, we'll explore what several local agencies are doing to further Earth Day initiatives. So get ready to learn how you can spread the word, volunteer, and help make Earth Day every day. It's all coming up right after this. Welcome back everyone. During this edition of In Studio, we'll be discussing Earth Day initiatives with Ecological Consulting Services, Citizens Against Toxic Exposure, and organizers from Earth Day Pensacola. Meanwhile, in this segment, we'll focus our attention on the Escambia County Natural Resources Management Department, and I'm happy to introduce its director, Chips Kirschenfeld. Hello. Now, in addition, we're excited to have Lori Murphy, Executive Director of Emerald Coast Keeper Incorporated, including one of her faithful volunteers, Andy Lynn. Welcome to all of you. Thank you, Ramika. Thank you all right, Lori, let's start with you, Emerald Coast Keeper. Please give us an overview. Well, Emerald Coast Keeper began as uh, an organization from Waterkeeper Alliance out of New York, where Bobby Kennedy Jr., who of course was an attorney up there, an environmental attorney, decided that we've had enough of the fires on the Hudson River right. and we have got to do something to clean up our water. And so now there are currently 311 affiliate members all over the world internationally in I believe 34 different countries and six continents now. All right, now here locally, what is the depth of the expanse that you cover? Well, actually, my territory runs from like the Perdido Key area all the way out to Cape Sandblast. So I work on the whole panhandle that includes the bays and the bayous, the Gulf of Mexico, but it also includes many of the fresh water bodies like streams and lakes and rivers as well. All right. So you basically have four central areas, right? Well, basically, for if you want to group them, okay. um, I call them mainly our freshwater groups and our, our brackish waters and, and salt water. So it's probably three major groups. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to take care of all of them. They're all equally important. And a lot of folks don't realize the impacts that uh, our water actually has on our ability to have the right for swimmable, drinkable, fishable water. All right. Now, Lori, have you ever worked hand in hand with chips over here on anything? Oh, a few times, yes, hand in hand. Chips is, uh, he is like a plethora of information. He's been a great support factor and mentor for myself and our organization and provides a lot of scientific information. Uh, he's been there numerous times when I've needed him or had questions. And uh, so I really appreciate his support. All right, Chips, into your corner now. Let's talk about the Restore Acts, the things that you are doing right now. The uh, Restore Act, uh, Ramika, obviously came about uh, from the BP oil spill uh, seven years ago this month, um, where over 170 million gallons of oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. So the Restore Act uh, came about to compensate uh, the public for uh, the natural resource damages as well as the economic damages. Here in Escambia County, uh, we have been very busy the last few years and we will be for the next 15 years uh, implementing uh, and constructing projects uh, to uh, replace those lost functions and values of the natural resources that were damaged and destroyed during the oil spill. So we're working on uh, a whole suite of projects now 
uh, and we will be continuing to work on those projects uh, for the next 15 years. All right, so under the Restore Act, the compensation for those who were impacted by the PP oil spill, is that still ongoing? It is. Um, you know, there uh, were some initial uh, uh, fatalities, a bottlenose dolphin, uh, over a thousand dolphins were, were killed initially, uh, and over uh, six six thousand uh, sea turtles were killed, um, and, and th those were the initial fatalities. We we really don't know yet what the long term uh, consequences uh, will be uh, from that oil spill. But uh, a lot of the the funding that is available in the Restore right. Act is going to uh, good research that will try to answer those questions. All right. Good information. I'll be back with you in just a moment, getting back to the Emerald Coast Keeper. So Andy, you're a volunteer. What piqued your interest? Uh, an item showed up in my uh, Facebook feed uh, and it sounded cool. I was like, well, it's cool. that sounds like a good <laughs> idea. Uh, I grew up here and the whole time growing up, uh, anytime Carpenter Creek was mentioned, everybody had to say, oh yeah, it's all polluted. And I thought, why should we settle for that? There's no point. We can do something about it. So, so give me I'm happy one. To do it. It's amazing. Give me one volunteer story, maybe an area where you have volunteered, and how it has impacted your life. Well, I've found some uh, some pretty interesting items in the creek. Uh, a lot of them look like they've been there for quite some time. Uh, found a lawn chair that was grown into the bank. Oh. Um, found shopping carts, uh, sleeping bags, tents. Uh, Pretty much everything, everything you can think of. I found a Book of Mormon. I don't know how that ended up in there, but there it was. So, um, all kinds of stuff. So when it comes to motivating others to be volunteers, right, Lori? Andy, from your perspective, have you rallied any into the fold? I've done my best, yes. I've, uh, I've notified a lot of folks about this appearance and cleanups that we've done and things like that. And some people have showed up with friends of their own. So it just kind of works its way out. All right, so Lori, let's talk about rolling up those sleeves because, hey, you've done quite a bit and you're so modest, beautiful lady. <laughs> I've got to give you some credit here. So tell me about some of the, I guess, projects that you felt had been the hardest for you. Well, there's probably two in particular that are real close to my heart, and one is the Tanyards neighborhood uh, downtown uh, in the Pensacola area. And it is in a minority neighborhood, and they, the city had contracted uh, someone to build a stormwater pond there, and there's been a lot of problems as far as I, uh, being a um, certified stormwater inspector, I had identified 13 violations uh, that were affecting these minorities that really didn't know how, they didn't have a voice, they really didn't know how to address the city. Uh, or the contractor their concerns and they're very upset um, a lot of times they couldn't even get out to their cars because it was flooding into their yards and in their driveways uh, it was causing they couldn't let their dogs out children were out there playing in the water um, that was all full of mud and possible contaminants right. from an old uh, mosquito site that had not been completely rectified at this time and I contacted you know the authorities several times trying to get some results uh, and was not able to get really anywhere with it so uh, what I did was I went public with it and I got uh, I went on radio and I went on television and I went in the newspaper and I tried to let people know this is wrong this isn't fair uh, this isn't a problem with environmental justice here this is not this is not right the way they're building this pond compared to other construction sites now, talking about going public with things, I'm pretty sure you're all ears chips all the time, right? Tell me some of the things you hear regarding our environment and things that are happening in the Pensacola well, area. Uh, with, with the Escambia County Natural Resources Department, uh, included in that department is the Environmental Code Enforcement Division uh, and also the Marine Resources Division and the Mosquito Control Division and the Water Quality and Land Management Division. So uh, the, the Escambia County Natural Resources Department covers a, a, quite a bit of the okay. natural resources here in Escambia County. 
Um, the Code Enforcement Division is uh, receiving uh, complaints all the time for sediment and erosion control issues, as Laurie mentioned. Uh, mosquito control divisions uh, receiving uh, phone calls from the public with mosquito issues. Okay. Uh, so uh, we, we, we stay very, very busy uh, trying to help the public uh, with their problems that they're having with our, our natural resources. Very good. Now let's talk about some common culprits, Lori. Septic tanks, commercial vessels, I know the list goes on and on, doesn't it, it? It does go on and on, and with Carpenter Creek, you know, I think what folks don't realize is that people themselves are our largest polluter, and we don't even know we're doing it sometimes. Um, we have to be mindful of what we dump down our sinks, our toilets, uh, stormwater drains. Um, this makes Chip's job a lot easier, my job a lot easier, if you know we can get some public outreach. And look what happened to Carpenter Creek with Andy having to pull all of these items, such as toilets and sinks and things out that you know that residents are doing right. this. So, do you accept monetary donations from the we public? We do. We do. You can become a member or just donate in general. Uh, you can go to our site at www.emeraldcoastkeeper.org. We'll put that up too later. And we have uh, social media, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and uh, LinkedIn, so you can get a hold of us at any time. And you can report pollution as well if you see something. Andy, why do you think it's so important for people to give of their time in regard to the Emerald Coast Keeper? It's as simple as uh, wanting to live in a nicer place. Um, like I said, I grew up here. Um, I've got kids and grandkids of my own. Uh, not only do I want to set a good example for them, but I'd like to do something to maybe leave it a little better than I found it. That's about it. So, Lori, tell us why people shouldn't be afraid to report bad things that they see happening to our environment. Well, because sometimes they're not aware of what they are really seeing, and it can be anonymous. You can report it. You don't have to leave your name. I don't have to let people know. But just tell me. If there's something that you see, let us know. That's what we're here for. And uh, believe it or not, there are plenty of people in the city and the county and my organization that really do care and will help to resolve the problem. So they should do that because we can't be everywhere all the time. No, you can't. And how do you recruit your volunteers mostly? I know we have the website, but maybe through personal connections as well? Social media uh, is how I found Andy. A lot of times I'll do ads uh, and spend money on Facebook. And uh, I have one going right now for a contest that we're in. We're in a national contest to win $100,000 for Carpenter Creek with USA Today and the Gannett Company. Uh, and if you go to our Facebook page, you can go. If you vote every day between now and May the 12th, whoever gets the most votes gets in the running and uh, it'll help us restore some of these things. All right, so Chips, ending with you, specific things that your office is doing to educate others about the importance of conservation, in a nutshell, that is. Education and outreach is, is a very important part of, of everything we do. Uh, we, we, we come in contact with many citizens every day. Um, and there are projects that the county works on, some of the, the BP projects in the Jones Creek watershed and the Bay Chico watershed, for example, where citizens uh, can volunteer and, and help the county with those projects. All right, wonderful. And thanks so much to all of you. So as we had to break, get those pens and pencils ready. We're going to tell you how you can become a volunteer with Emerald Coast Keeper. For more information, contact Lori Murphy at 850 292-5960 or you can log on to the website www.emeraldcoastkeeper.org We'll be back in a moment. WSRE is celebrating 50 years and the local teachers who embrace TV as a pioneering tool before the digital revolution. While laptops, the web, and other digital resources now keep students busy, popular PBS shows enriched the classroom experience decades ago. Favorites like Nova, Reading Rainbow, and Bill Nye the Science Guy help local teachers strategically incorporate math, science, and technology into lesson plans. Innovative workshops designed by PBS and presented by WSRE provided professional development for teachers helping them engage young minds with educational television that fostered lifelong learning. 
and we couldn't have done it without you, that generous support, a part of our past and future. everyone. During this segment, we're shifting our focus to the Dead Man's Island Restoration Project in Gulf Breeze. I'm honored to introduce Heather Reed, Project Manager for Ecological Consulting Services. Joining her, Stephen Schwartz, Command Chaplain for the Naval Aviation Schools Command. Heather, I understand the Dead Man's Island Restoration Project is already underway. Can you give us an overview? Uh, yeah, well, currently we're placing our breakwater today, as a matter of fact, and we'll continue on throughout the week. Uh, we have about 22,000 plants that we're going to be planting behind the breakwater and an additional 15,000. Um, we've just moved 16,000 cubic yards of sand, so we'll have more plants. So, so let's go back a little bit. The name Dead Man's Island, why was it named that? Is there a little bit of history behind that? Well, Dead Man's dates back all the way to the 1500s, and of course the Spanish and the British owned it. But really, the name Dead Man's Island comes from the Yellow Fever Quarantine Station. Oh, okay, yes, yes. when the U.S. bought it. So um, Hurricane Dennis came through and exposed several coffins, and uh, of course Dead Man's Island had an erosion problem, and so verified that um, we had have an unmarked cemetery and verified the yellow fever quarantine. Interesting factoids there. So what is the expanse of the entire project? I guess a before and after overview. I'm sure it's devastating. Oh, it was. And back in 2007, we started this project. Um, the Army Corps actually started the project and it was held up in permitting. They had the money through the Estuary Act grant. Um, but unfortunately, the permitting didn't go through and the project didn't go through. Uh, they hired me and we went ahead and went through the permitting and uh, in 2008 we placed our first breakwater oh, and what? yes and then in 2009 we placed additional breakwater and in 2010 the oil spill came right. and we had some problems with the oyster die off and then we placed new breakwaters in 2011. And so we're continuing on with the project. It's, it's ongoing. So let's talk about breakwater for just a moment. For those out there who might not know what that is, can you break that down for us a little? Sure, what we have is a wave attenuation. So uh, Dead Man's Island is susceptible to erosion due to the bridges, the dredging, seawalls right. that we have. Um, once, once you have permitted activities that affect a natural resource, Dead Man's is one of 21 coastal barrier resource units in Florida um, then that's when you get into the issue of um, major coastal erosion. Right. So Stephen, you do quite a bit. Yes. <laughs> now let me ask you this, I know education is so important to you, but when it comes to rallying the troops or the volunteers for this awesome initiative, I know that you're in the Navy, but are other branches of the military involved? Oh yes, uh, uh, here at Naval Av Aviation Schools Command, we we uh, we have sailors, we have Marines, we have Coast Guard, and and um, you know we're, we're, we may wear different uniforms, but we're all one team. Right. Um, to work with Heather over at Dead Man's Island, I can tell you, and I can be perfectly honest, all I had to do is tell them they're going to a place called Dead Man's Island, and I had to tell people, hey, maybe we we don't have enough room on the bus <laughs> to get them over there. You know, we have a we have a very young population of volunteers who are in the service this day and age, and they were just itching at the fact that they could get over there and and help out the environment. So, give me a day in the life of a volunteer. Maybe just one time when you all have had a group, and I know you've done it quite a bit. But give me an example of one day what you did when you showed up and the end result. So. Um, with this, we have many different volunteer opportunities. With, with Heather. 
Uh, we, we partnered about two years ago. That's when we first partnered. Um, and then she was still working the breakwater. Okay. Uh, she told me that there was there were there were things in the ocean that were simply not not good, <laughs> and we were replacing it with with the new breakwater. And I was like, well, we need to get people over there. We need to help her out, and uh, get, getting those those sailors over there, they were more than happy to to get over there into the surf and and have fun, into put on surf. some. <laughs> <laughs> some suntan lotion and take out the bad stuff and put in the good stuff. And oh yeah, you can't forget that suntan lotion. Protect your cells, people, right? right? That's right. So the process, now we see a lot of awesome pictures up on the screen. What is the process, I guess, for helping prevent these issues? I know there's several things that you all are doing. Just tell me one specific thing that you do that takes a lot of time when it comes to this. Well, um, like I said, it, it's a, um, a federal study site, and so putting together the grants uh, to pay for the projects, to putting together the volunteers, you know, coordinating the volunteers with the school systems, uh, with the military, with the general public, uh, that takes a lot of time. Um, but then working on the project in general, in general. It's, it's a constant study. We're constantly doing research. Um, you know, we have the Student Monitoring Area Restoration Techniques Program, and so we bring in internships. That's good. We bring in a lot of, of opportunities for students, for adults, for, um, you know, the general public to help with the research as well. And a little birdie told me that Gopher High School has helped you from time to time. Oh, that's right, yes. And even the Boy Scouts, right? Yes, Let's yes. Talk we about get a them. lot of, of great support from the Boy Scouts. They create some of their Eagle Scout projects on Dead Man's Island. Um, we've, we've done some underwater educational kiosks. We've worked on some trails. We've worked on filling oyster bags so, and, and planting. You also mentioned previously when you and I had a chance to chat a specific little Boy Scout who wasn't able to make it tonight. Garrett, his name is Garrett Edwards. Garrett Bless Edwards, his heart. Yes. Let's talk about him because he's a Boy Scout, and I tell you, I think it's awesome for them to be involved. So elaborate a little bit. Well, um, the Boy Scouts have a, a wonderful program. They they camp and they camp out at Dead Man's Island, and they always offer to help with certain projects on Dead Man's, help with the cleanups. And Garrett was one of those Boy Scouts, and he's been doing that for a while. And so he's he's the number one Boy Scout. Number it's, one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's he's always in there and, and helping out and helping with the uh, the restoration project and bringing in other troops as well. That's good. Yeah. So Stephen, back to you. Yes. I know that you probably coordinate a lot of volunteer efforts with specific meaning and purpose behind the the issue for Dead Man's Island, but mm -hmm. you just seem like an awesome person all around, and I know that you are. What piqued your individual interest in this? Well, uh, I can tell you that, that like most volunteers that I serve with in the, in the Navy, um, where we go, uh, that's our home. Well, we hang our has our home. You know, a few years ago is San Diego. Here it's Pensacola. Pensacola. And I'm going back to San Diego in a few more months. But for right now, this is my home. This is my community. And we work well to, to, to invest in community. Particularly when we see pillars like Heather Reed who, who are passionate and they see the problem and we want to be part of the solution that she sees the problem to. All right. So, Heather, why is it so important to get that grass planted as quickly as possible. Tell us about that. Well, you know, shoreline restoration and coastal resilience is important, especially in this area. Um, you know, one of the prob problems that I'm encountering right now is, uh, well, believe it or not, sea level rise. It's in our backyard. We could show from the NOAA tide charts that our predicted tides are actually lower than the actual tides. So I actually have to put together a plan to not only um, have the right type of plant. So you have saltwater tolerant plants that are at the very, um, at, that are at the edge of the shoreline. Well, if you have sea level rise, that covers those plants and smothers those. And then you have what you call your upland plants, which are your non-saltwater oh, tolerant okay. plants. So those smother out. So you have a vulnerable shoreline then. So now we have to come up with ways to create deeper depths uh, where we can put um, saltwater tolerant plants behind the upland plants um, because coastal resilience is so important. But sea level rise, we're just 
we're having to work with that right now and try to find innovative ways, innovative ways. to uh, keep our shorelines and prevent additional erosion. So prior to planting, I know prep work, talk about that a little bit. I know it's hard though when you don't have that grass, right? So. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we, we have to do a lot of surveying. We have to make sure that um, uh, we have the right type of plants. We have um, the right type of breakwater to stop the wave action. Um, and, and our breakwaters are important because we want uh, breakwaters that promote habitat, oyster reefs, uh, fisheries. Uh, so sometimes you can't use an oyster reef breakwater. We have to create hybrids, and I've created a hybrid reef that um, is structurally sound, but yet creates uh, oyster habitat and fisheries habitat. Stephen, you've seen this firsthand emotionally for you, seeing where we were, right, with Dead Man's Island, where we are now. We still have a long way to go, but personally, how does it impact you, make you feel when, hey, we're definitely making strides here. You know, my volunteer team um, really put out the effort to, to go uh, and, and help Heather with her efforts in this. And, and it personally gives me great pride in the people who, who have done this and went out there and, and have um, helped the environment and helped Heather in this. Have any of your volunteers ever shared maybe a personal story that you would like to elaborate on? Maybe just maybe the way it's impacted a person's life. Someone you out know, there. Um, there's a couple here who who joined me tonight. They they uh, they're pretty amazing uh, young men, and uh, when they came back from their first from their first trip, initially they were there just to make sure that the the military uh, personnel were weren't doing anything crazy. <laughs> okay, or whatever, nothing know. crazy. But when they got there, they realized we're there, and, and we're gonna we're gonna help Heather, and we're gonna knock this out. And they came back, and it, it really enriched their lives. And and because of that, it became sort of a what the Navy calls a force multiplier. I like that. More and more people, and they started telling their friends, who told their friends, kind of an organic network. Next thing you know, we have we have a lot of people going out there to help Heather, and as well as other volunteers. And I know you are oh so proud of them. So. Heather, let's talk dollars and cents. You're a grant writer and you do it so well, but it takes money, right? Okay. So how are things looking? Um, well, you know, right now, um, it, over the years, we've gotten about $4 million in grant money, in federal grant money. It is a research project, so we're constantly looking at innovative ways to determine transferability to other restoration projects. So the federal government um, gets us this grant money. So right now, um, the city of Gulf Breeze has paid um, over $100,000 for this new breakwater. Um, and then uh, we're hoping to get more money from uh, NIFWIF and NOAA and hopefully the EPA. So Wonderful news. Thank you to both of you. It's been such a pleasure. Now, folks, to learn more about the Dead Man's Island Restoration Project and how you can lend a helping hand, please call Heather Reed at 850-346-2073 or log on to the website www.socializewitheducation.org. Just think, you can be that change that motivates others to make this world a much better place. WSRE is celebrating 50 years and the PBS show that put local kids inspired to make a difference in the national spotlight. In the 2000s, Zoom motivated 6 to 11 year olds to investigate, create, and problem solve. It was television by, for, and about children and empowered them to be more. Once engaged, they volunteered, teamed up, and gave back. Zoom connected kids with each other and their communities for seven seasons. Their projects and fundraisers collected countless dollars and changed lives. Their stories, produced by WSRE as Zoom into Action segments, went national. Children from across Northwest Florida didn't just watch the program, they were on it from coast to coast. That's pioneering children's television and just one reason we're celebrating 50 years.
are back and during this segment we'll focus on Citizens Against Toxic Exposure or Kate. It's an initiative that was started by the late Margaret Williams. Tonight I would like to welcome her daughter Francine Ishmael who serves as Executive Director. Her husband Eddie Ishmael Jr. is an age educator and workshop presenter for Kate. Thank you so much for joining us, the both of you. Now, Francine, please give us an overview of Kate. Well, Kate began in the spring, early spring of 92. Um, my mother was still working as an educator for the uh, Escambia School District, and she was uh, planning to retire. She received a call from um, one of the residents that lived in the uh, near the Escambia treating area, and they were concerned about uh, seeing men in moon suits coming out in their neighborhood um, digging up soil and not notifying the community of what was going on. So um, she got together with some of the other homeowners and they decided to form an organization and by spring of 92 Kate was born and they began to get answers from the EPA of what was going on and they found out that the Iskamia treating site was contaminated and that um, it needed to be cleaned up. And so they were doing an emergency cleanup, but um, that wasn't the way to go about it. So they started to have more of a dialogue with the EPA and the community once the organization was formed and became a 501c3. So we see an aerial shot right now, but here's the thing, the total expanse of that area and your mother being brave at that time to come forward, mm -hmm. that is huge. Did anyone try to prevent her from doing so? Well, she did have some resistance. Um, surprisingly from some of the people that were still residents there were not fully educated on what was happening and had grown to love their neighborhood and did not want to be uprooted. Um, she had resistance from the local officials um, not wanting to bring this issue to the forefront um, because that meant that they would have to deal with this big problem and it was a lot bigger than what she thought when she started to bring all of this bring information. Bring to pass. Mm -hmm. I understand it was known as Mount Dioxin. Mm -hmm. Was that a name that was coined? It was. It was coined by her. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, felt that it was appropriate because it was um, the the main contaminant was dioxin, and it was a mound of dirt that had sat in that area for a long time before anything had been done about it. Francine, I'll get back to you in just a moment. Now, Eddie, interesting story here. So, you actually lived in that contaminated mm -hmm. area. So, I want you just to take us back and give us an idea of when you first found out about the issue and, and how it impacted you. Take us back. Well, as kids, I didn't actually live in the area. All my relatives lived there. So you so had I family was there a lot. and you visited. And uh, we'd visit and it would be a yellow smog. We had no idea that it was toxic. There was no talk about toxicity back then. It actually etched the window panes you couldn't see out of them because of the how it would eat into the glass, so you could imagine what it was doing to us. And uh, when I grew up, uh, moved up there full time and found out this was an issue. And because of my background uh, working in the poison center, I had a little bit more information than the general public. And Francine and I met and we kind of got together and mom asked me to do some community education, things like that with the organization and that's where we got started. So when it comes to geography, Francine, tell us about the specific area where this is located, Mount Dioxin. It, it, it seems to be in the center of Pensacola, uh, one of the, in the main corridor off of Palafox Street. Um, it's north of Fairfield Drive, right before you get to Brent Lane, and it's two Superfund sites, the agrochemical plant and the Iskamia Treating Company that's within a quarter mile of each other, and between that sits two to three neighborhood, four neighborhoods that uh, were affected by those areas. Now let's go back to your mother, Margaret. Mm -hmm. How did she actually rally others to support this cause? Well, she surrounded herself with people that um, had experience and, and, and gained resources that helped start the organization. She had people like Frances Dunham, Sherry Myers was very instrumental right. in getting um, the 501c3 started for her. 
um, and she, you know, started to educate herself more on what was going on and, and how to run the organization and, and gather other people that were in the Pensacola area and outside of the Pensacola area that could come in and, and just rally more support for her. And that's when it, it really kind of blew up. She got Lois Gibbs involved from Love Canal that came down and um, was one of her big supporters. Eddie touched on this a little bit earlier, but impacting those people who live there early on, medically speaking, were there any symptoms of ailments, things that just weren't right that your mother may have noticed or you may have noticed? You know, people were complaining about a lot of respiratory conditions, a lot of skin conditions, um, birth defects, um, various types of cancers, um, diabetes was a big one that was, um, that stood out. A lot of people were experiencing that. Well, we understand this is the third largest Superfund relocation project, initially about 358 families and later on about 45 mm -hmm. families, mm -hmm. but impacted a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Now, Francine, I know they had to move, but Explain to us how that process impacted those people. Many of them, as Eddie, you said, had lived there yeah. for quite some time. You had family Lots that had lived there for a long time, yeah. right? So let's, let's talk about it from your perspective. As if you lived somewhere for a while, that's your home. And they were very, very reluctant to move. But uh, once we had the second uh, phase started, where we got chemists to come in and actually proved to the government that we had a problem. It became a community emergency. And some of them moved out even before we got relocated because they didn't want to be exposed anymore. So it really did have a psychological and a financial effect on everybody that was up there, including myself. Financially, Francine, let's talk about that. Relocation, were they given fair market value for their homes or land? And well, of course we know. No, they really were not. A lot of the people that moved, moved into um, substandard housing. Um, they were not given fair appraisals that they should have been given based on the Corps of Engineer relocation policy. Um, the homes were not inspected. There was one elderly lady that was moved into a home and she had a, a leak from her furnace that wasn't inspected by the inspectors prior to her moving in there and she it ended up costing her an additional five thousand dollars to get that repaired and it was just they were not checking um, these areas that people were, were living in and when some of the um, property owners in the neighborhood said a lot of the people did move in to realize that there was going to be an influx of uh, people needing places to stay they just basically painted homes and did a little yard manicuring, but n did not bring the homes up to par. And the areas were high crime areas, so they went from basically from bad to worse. And it was a lot of people that were not happy. There were people that had to incur mor mortgages as a result of that because they did not get fair market value for their property. Um, and so there were some that were unhappy and they were not, they didn't feel like they were treated fairly um, and some of them were even told you take it or you leave it. So we know over 300,000 tons of toxic waste were removed and the EPA came in and it was covered up but tell us a little bit more about that. So the area covered up but does that solve the problem? It really did not. It mitigated some of the problem. Um, it just, it, it wasn't the best cleanup that we would like to have had. Um, it was cleaned up to more of a commercial standard and not necessarily a residential standard. So they kind of cut corners. Um, but there are still some contaminants that exist, um, but it's not suitable for people to still live there. So Eddie, we see the homes surrounding that area. Mm -hmm. Really, there are homes right outside of that. Does that make you have any kind of fearful ideas of sort? Well, the government thinks that toxins stop at street signs, and they don't. We still have a plume under that area that's migrating toward Ayutahar, downtown Pensacola, that they monitor. So the, we still have the problem for future generations to address. 
So talk a little bit more about the workshops that you conduct for Kate. Give us a rundown of that. The workshops conduct uh, usually generated through our monthly meetings and I will ask them who's having what types of problems. Uh, we talk about chemical exposures and things like that and how you can be exposed at home without the toxins that are actually in the environment. Just general education things and how they can protect themselves and things they need to do when they go to the doctor to use that 15 minutes that they have con constructively. Know what's wrong with you, right. know when your symptoms start, things like that. Francine, have you heard of any instances of people that are still being impacted today? Well, people, you know, they still complain about the health issues um, that they feel were directly related to their exposure to those chemicals that they have lived uh, near. But they're, you know, what can you do? They're not getting the help that they need. They're getting the education that we can provide to them to help the next generation from, you know, being exposed and what to do. But as far as, um, you know, trying to solve those problems, right. it's very difficult when, you know, you, we don't have the resources to be able to do that. Has the EPA mentioned any specific plans to you to come back and revisit this? Have you heard anything? Well, the EPA does a five-year review where they uh, connect with the organization and ask questions. <laughs> Um, they monitor the site to make sure that it's uh, being manicured, but they have not um, made any plans for any type of um, industry or what they're going to do with the site. It's still sitting there, but they do a five-year review and they do okay. connect with me. So thinking back on your mother and really what she would think today if she were still alive with your efforts that you're pursuing through Kate, what would you tell someone out there who is maybe interested in joining this initiative with both of you? Well, um, we would tell them to be patient, <laughs> have a lot of energy, and, and you know, to help prepare the next generation for the issues that still exist, not just in Pensacola, but all over the country. And, um, you know, we want to work to try to be a clearinghouse for a lot of other organizations, not just in Pensacola. And, um, and it's gonna take a younger generation to be mindful of that because it, we still have a lot of work to do. Education is key to be informed. Any final words, Eddie? No, we just like uh, more uh, funding, all the government funding dried up and if we could get funding, we can do more education to the general public. All right, thank you all so very much for informing us. I've definitely learned a lot, thanks to both of you. Now folks, if you'd like to know more about Citizens Against Toxic Exposure or Kate, please contact Francine Ishmael at the following number, 850-432-2228. We'll be back right after this. WSRE is celebrating 50 years and remembering the show that gave the station its largest audience. Not Julia Child, not just a French chef. For 17 years, Earl Peru mesmerized viewers with classic recipes celebrated on both sides of the Atlantic. The New Orleans native crisscrossed Europe and Japan to study under some of the world's best, then shared his passion with generations of aspiring chefs. That's because gourmet cooking was their classroom, and it was yours. Gourmet cooking tempted viewers with irresistible recipes, many rich in local history. Earl Peru's Gourmet Cooking, the first WSRE production to air nationally from the station celebrating 50 years.
like Bob Ross and paint a happy little tree in support of WSRE. As part of the station's 50th anniversary celebration, WSRE will host the Cinco de Mayo Fiesta Paint Party on Friday, May 5th in the Amos Studio. Come paint the tree of life with event sponsor, Painting with a Twist, and enjoy fiesta-style food and drink from Moe's Southwest Grill. The cost is $50 and benefits the WSRE TV Foundation. Seating is limited, so register now at WSRE.org slash 50. The American dream isn't what it used to be, especially for our kids. That's where research led Robert Putnam, a Harvard professor and author, who will be part of WSRE's Public Square Speaker Series in partnership with Studer Community Institute on April 18th. Putnam's 2015 book, Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis, chronicles the opportunity gap that is growing in America that is leaving millions of children from low-income families behind. Join the Studer Community Institute and WSRE on April 18th in the Amos Studio to learn from Putnam how our community can close the gap and improve the quality of life for everyone in the community. It's another step in our journey to build an early learning city on the site of North America's oldest settlement. And it is a way that we can build a brain, build a life, and build a community. Admission is free. Advanced registration is required at WSRE.org slash speakers. Folks, as we continue our Earth Day discussion, Pensacola is gearing up for a spectacular day filled with exciting events and educational opportunities for the entire family. I'm thrilled to introduce Tiffany Miller, Vendor Coordinator of Earth Day Pensacola, Rick Kendall, Music Director, and Karen Sanchez, Organizer of Pensacola's first ever March for Science. Quite interesting. All right, Tiffany, let's start with you, Earth Day Pensacola. How many years have we been having this? Um, officially, or like nationally, it's been uh, since 1970, and here in Pensacola, about 27 years. All right, so we have some interesting things going on. Your theme is energy, transportation, sustainability. and sustainability. I like those three. So talk a little bit more about those, energy. Let's talk about that first. Um, well, we have a lot of people coming that are, are we have um, somebody with the solar panels, and we have more like hybrid energy cars, um, and more um, eco-friendly ways of like farming and things like that. Well, putting something like this together, you just don't snap your fingers and say, hey, Earth Day Pensacola is on. It takes a lot of work behind the scenes, right? It so does, How yeah. long have you all been planning for this? Um, this is actually my first year. Um, my parents were on it in the 90s, so I just kind of felt like I'm, you know, carrying that torch. Grandfather did. Yeah. <laughs> carrying the torch. Rick here, uh, he's been on for... Uh, 10 years. Yeah, 10 about 10 11. years, 10 or 11 years. Well, Rick, let me talk to you for a second. Music, a lot of times people say music can set the stage or the tone for any kind of event. How long have you been the music coordinator? I think this is my 11th year. For, 11 for, years. I've been on the Earth Day Committee, and um, I do the music, but also we all, when we get together as a, as a group in our meetings, we all just chime in with what you know, whatever topic, whatever we need to help with, so it's pretty good. So the music, let's just... I don't know, an overview visually that I'm thinking. So you show up for Earth Day, right, at Bayview Park. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to hear some music You will somewhere, hear the music, yeah. Right? At the end of the dog park, there's a big oak tree, and I always set up the music at the end of, you know, right under that big oak tree. So it's pretty, it's a nice, nice environment. Do you have any particular kinds of music that you play or it's personal a, request? It is a mix. Um, this year we have Hedons of Reason at 1015, Shelby Brown, she was on uh, The Voice, uh, Dalton Wright, Kristen Elizabeth Long, String Farm, and then Jeff Glickman. So we have everything from string music to blues to um, oh, original. Um, so a little a outdoor of event there attracting these local artists, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty good. Headliners. That's they're headliners. Yes, they're headliners. Every one of them. <laughs> every one of them. Um, I, I always try and uh, book people that will play original music for most events that I do. Just um, I think it's important to get their their sounds out. So. So from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., we're going to hear some music. There'll be lots of music. Lots of music. All right, Karen. Let me shift over okay. here. March for mm -hmm. Science. Now this is the first ever March for Science. I want you to tell us about it. Okay, right. a lot of people don't know about it. So the March for Science is a celebration of science. 
it's um, kind of liken the group to a little modern day science love story. It was born online via social media. It was um, three people in particular kind of started the, the national march that will be taking place on April 22nd in, in Washington, D.C. Um, it started on Reddit. They were sharing just some similar opinions that they had, some concerns that they had um, a, a, about maybe some threats okay. to science, you know, you know recently. Um, so they got together. They decided they wanted to march. They created a Facebook page. It got a lot of action and a lot of likes and a lot of shares. And then since that time in January, it's popped up in so many places, not just nationally, but around the world, that we are going to have marches in about 40 countries and over 400 of them across the country. As you say, it's part of the mm -hmm. Earth Day yes. network. And yes. you all are collaborating mm -hmm. with, right, Earth Day Pensacola. We so are. how are you informing people about the march, I guess, gathering people together? Mm -hmm. So we decided to partner with Earth Day Pensacola. They do an amazing job year after year of, of their festival. I know it's a you know, favorite of mine. I've gone year after year myself. Um, so we decided that since it was purposeful for the national a march to, to be held on this day that we wanted to get together with them. So they will both be at Bayview Park. Um, we're actually going to do kind of a kickoff to Earth Day. We'll be uh, gathering between 9 and 9.30 that morning, marching between 9.30 and 10, kickoff for Earth Day, then, you know, at 10 o'clock from 10 to 4. And um, we'll be sticking around as well and taking part in Earth Day with them. Well, I'm really glad they're both on the same day. Yeah. <laughs> so why is this initiative so near and dear to your heart? Mm -hmm. um, so ever since I, I was a little girl, you could call me a, a science enthusiast, but uh, I am a science teacher. I've actually been a science educator for um, over 15 years now. Um, I, this, is, this is the cause that's always been been my number one. So yeah, I'm just uh, getting involved lately. Love Earth Day. Glad to be a part of that through this as well. So as a science teacher, I'm curious, mm -hmm. and I think about the science fair. I mm -hmm. took part in that <laughs> back in the day. So do you have a lot of schools participating we do. in this We do. We have actually some of our organizers are um, science students at Good. the university. We've got undergrad and graduate students that are working so hard so in so many amazing ways to make this happen. We have some science educators that are also part of our group and who will be coming out to Earth Day and helping us kind of man the the booths and we've got some science activities for kids going on as well. It's going yeah. to be a blast so as they would say. Everyone, right. you know. <laughs> All right so Tiffany let's talk about wind energy and solar energy. I know you hear about it all the time right? Mm -hmm. Will there be specific displays like that? We do. Um, this year we have Dan Gardner uh, with Compass Solar and he'll be out there displaying um, the solar panels. Um, and then we're going to have um, the Tesla car out there, and then oh, I think Sandy Sanson's going to come out with Is he something. giving away a car? No. <laughs> I mean, no. <laughs> that would be nice. Okay, let's talk about water education vendors, clean water, mm -hmm. right? So when it comes to the vendors, and I saw some pictures, awesome pictures that were sent that Eric sent, and I do hope he feels better. We're missing him. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I saw a lot of pictures of indoor vendors with booth set up. So talk about the varying aspects of the vendors that you have. I guess maybe you could have some organizations here and someone presenting pottery. I saw some beautiful bowls and other things and I saw fresh green vegetables, which were probably organic. Is that true? More than likely, yeah. They should they better be. But, uh. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we have um, like Pensacola Mess Hall is going to come out and there's a there's a giant um, kids area so you can bring the family, you know, bring the pets too. It's the, um, but they, um, we also have some, uh, a vendor who's going to have like natural, um, you know, health and beauty products, um, different. Um, Everything like, imaginable, right? Mm -hmm, pretty much, yeah. Now, when it comes to training the volunteers, now, Rick, I know you deal with the music, but you probably have some volunteers in the music department. Yep. Mm -hmm. Am I right? So does that come pretty easy for you? Well, the volunteers, we reach out to a lot of different the schools. Um, a lot of the high schools and schools have to do volunteer hours, so we reach out to those groups and, um, and to just get the kids involved because I really believe that the kids, get, reaching the kids at a young age 
instills the, the values of you know, sustainability for later on in life. So. Tiffany, what are some of the things that these volunteers could be doing? I would imagine you would have a lot of traffic, but it's all going to be organized, which I think is awesome. For sure. Maybe directing people to specific areas, because you did, as I saw in previous pictures, had the indoor vendors and the outdoor vendors as well. So talk about that just for a moment. Um, well, we definitely need people out there to help kind of set up and break down and, like you said, kind of... Um, work people around the festival and show them you know like we do have um, end of the line coming out so they'll be doing um, some food vending and um, just yeah. so some of the activities that the children will be involved in will they have games how's that going to be I know they're probably excited yeah there's supposed to be uh, a couple bouncy houses um, different games uh, Beth has uh, been in charge of that she's got a lot of arts and crafts stuff going on with that so That'd be exciting. All right, I'm sure a lot of kids will be out there. Back to the March for Science. I know that we have this collaboration there. Will you all be holding up any signs during the march? Will we you be saying will. anything? Talk about we that. We definitely do have some signs. Um, we actually had a little get together last week to kind of get some of those ready. Um, one of the the most fun things I think we've got ready for that is that along the march, we've actually created some little markers to Good. mark our, our path with science facts on them. So people who come out for the march not only will be you know celebrating, but learning something as well. I think that is quite innovative. So Tiffany, any last words for people that want to come out for Earth Day Pensacola? Don't hesitate, right? <laughs> right, um, I guess Go Green in 17 is our, um, theme, so we're going to um, try to encourage everybody to just come on out, enjoy the fun. Rick, all right, and I am just so grateful to all of you. I can't wait. Thank you. I know you can't either. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. All right, everyone, as we close the show, we want to provide details for the much anticipated Earth Day Pensacola. It'll be held Saturday, April 22nd from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Bayview Park. A major highlight no admission cost. For more information, you can email Eric St. Pierre at ericsaint.pierre03 at gmail.com or just simply log on to the website earthdaypensacola.org. During the next edition of In Studio, Sherry Hemminghouse Weeks will be exploring mental health, delving into such topics as depression, suicide, and mental disorders. Again, I want to thank all of our guests for joining us. I'm Ramika Vincent Leary. Have a good evening and remember to keep it locked in right here on WSRE PBS for the Gulf Coast.